Hi, I'm Melody, and welcome to my channel called A World to Win, where I talk about history, philosophy, and political economy from a Marxist perspective. Joining me today is Brianna from the channel Brianna's Library. Link in the description. Howdy folks, I'm Brianna, the host of Brianna's Library. I'm a booktuber who reads and discusses books on political science, history, race, and the radical left. In this video, we're going to be summarizing and commenting on the book The Coming of the American Behemoth, The Origins of Fascism in the United States, 1920-1940, by Michael Joseph Roberto, from Monthly Review Press, 2018. Before we begin, we wanted to give a big shout out to The Radical Reviewer, an awesome lefty YouTube creator whose book review format we have adopted here. I previously collaborated with him to review Socialism, Utopian and Scientific by Friedrich Engels, link in the description. His channel is an excellent resource for revolutionary political education, and I am proud to promote it here. Let's get into it. Introduction. In American Behemoth, Michael Joseph Roberto, referred to from here on in as MJR, employs two primary frameworks to explain the emergence of fascistic processes in the United States in the interwar years. First, MGR analyzes this period through a lens of Marxian political economy, understanding the turbulent economic changes of the Roaring Twenties and the years of the Locust, the Great Depression, are key to MGR's argument that American fascism has its seeds in the dynamics of monopoly finance capitalism. Second, MGR draws on a wealth of writings from a cohort of writers contemporary to the period, who range from journalists to economists and activists, many, though not all, of whom are Marxists. American Behemoth prominently features references to the writings of Marxian economist Louis Corey, whose 1934 book, The Decline of American Capitalism, serves as the bedrock for MGR's political economic framework. The works of other writers from the period, such as A.B. McGill, Henry Stevens, George Seldes, and Robert A. Brady serve as points of reference for how fascism was thought of through the eyes of American critics. For MJR, as for Marxist political economist Paul Baran, whom he cites in his introduction, it is insufficient to analyze fascism in the United States exclusively via comparisons to its European counterparts. The absence of certain key features which characterize for instance, German Nazism or Italian fascism, alone does not make the United States exempt from the phenomenon. By focusing too narrowly on similarities of geographically and culturally specific aspects of European fascism, it can be tempting to simply consider the case closed. MJR argues through the use of his historical sources that the uniquely American brand of fascism can be found in looking at the political and economic structures already existing in the system of monopoly finance capitalism, which rose to dominance in the early 20th century. According to MJR, mass movements of violent gangs such as Hitler's brown shirts did not pose the same kind of threats in the United States during this period. To be sure, they certainly existed and they were no less deadly, but they did not possess the character of a mass movement bent on seizing state power as in the case of the German Nazis or Italian fascists. Nonetheless, even given the absence of a mass movement of the European pedigree, the threat of fascism came from above. The consolidation of economic and political power in the hands of a tiny and shrinking cadre of monopolists and the overt suppression of dissident movements by both private union busters and agent provocateurs and police amounted to fascism, according to some of MGR's historical sources. A similar thesis was put forth by Bulgarian communist Georgi Dmitrov, for whom, quote, fascism does not arise overnight with the election of a fascist politician. Rather, fascism comes to power in stages, beginning with attacks on the democratic rights of working people, the imprisonment of communists and trade unionists, hostility to national minorities and immigrants, and the gradual erosion of democratic institutions." End quote. With this basic outline in mind, let's discuss the book in detail. The germ of fascism was inherent in American monopoly capitalism, but it was not until the economic crisis of 1929 that it developed into a definite political force of ominous proportions. <laughs> 
A.B. McGill, and Henry Stevens. The social structure of business is not one of democracy, but one of deference to power and authority. The great men of history are titans of industry. They are the fittest to survive. The apex predators of the capitalist system. This is not simply leftist pejorative, but in fact, how many of the executive stratum view themselves with this hierarchical conception of economic organization often accompanies a mirroring political outlook. As the former executive of the megacorp Remington Shoals typewriter company, Charles Norman Fay put it, quote, I do not believe in government by average men any more than in management of any other big business by average men. Average men are not big enough to govern. And in times of crisis, who better to set things to rights but the iron will of industry's big men? The slogan, Socialism or Barbarism, was first coined by Frederick Ingalls and later popularized by Rosa Luxemburg. This having the specific meaning that the outcome of capitalism's increasingly catastrophic crises held in it the potential to be an opportunity for socialist revolution or for a doubling down of the crushing power of the capitalist class in something resembling what we now call fascism. This is not a prophecy divined by consulting some authoritative source, but a prediction based on the scientific analysis of existing political economic processes at work within existing society. The method laid out by Karl Marx and Capital was to serve as the foundation for what the economist Lewis Corey would go on to explain in The Decline of American Capitalism. The intensifying gap between rich and poor, capitalist and worker, does not come from nowhere. The foundation of Marxian political economy holds that, in capitalist society, there are two main classes. The bourgeoisie, or capitalist class, who owns the means of production and subsistence. That is, the factories, farms, office buildings, and so on. And the proletariat, or working class, people like us who own little, if anything, other than our ability to work for a wage, which we then use to purchase our means of subsistence, food, shelter, and other vital resources, from the capitalist class. There are middle classes within this framework, but not middle class in the way that the term is usually used in everyday language today. The middle classes here encompass a variety of occupations and professions, such as low to mid-level managers, lawyers, highly paid technical workers, and small business owners. But we should be careful to note that this does not mean that the middle layers form a true class like the working or capitalist classes. They are usually drawn towards alignment with one of the main classes or the other. For instance, highly paid top level managers may not themselves be capitalists in the proper sense of the term, but because of the kind of work they do, in direct service to the capitalists, their interests are more aligned with the capitalists than the working class. On the other hand, a unionized technical worker might have a high salary, but identify themselves with their fellow workers despite being materially more well off. In analyzing fascism, MJR and his historical sources make an important point about this polarization between the working and capitalist classes and its effect on the middle layers. Those higher paid workers, managers, and so on are always threatened with proletarianization. That is to say, because capitalism compels businesses to cut down on costs and make themselves as lean as possible to keep making a profit, this means downsizing and offshoring. What was once a cushy position in the corporate hierarchy either gets cut out altogether or outsourced to a place with lower wages. As Corey noted, American workers made on average the same in 1929 as they did in 1923, even as the productivity skyrocketed. This is a tendency in capitalism which has not gone away. According to Pew Research, average hourly wages in America are about the same as they were in the mid-1970s. When a capitalist economy enters a period of severe crisis, this tendency of proletarianization, which is always active, intensifies greatly. The so-called middling men may seek solidarity with their fellow workers and join the labor movement or a socialist organization, 
Or, as MJR and his sources argue, they may be drawn in by the allure of fascistic ideologies, which point out a scapegoat such as Jews, black people, or other groups as the source of turmoil within society, rather than the underlying political economy of capitalism. This economic dimension is explored in exquisite detail in Chapter 2 of American Behemoth, entitled Fascist Processes in Capitalist Accumulation. We have laid out the broad strokes of this economic dynamic here, but an in-depth explanation of this complex element is beyond the scope of our review. Part 2. The General Crisis and Embryonic Fascism in the 1930s According to MJR, American exceptionalism is a significant reason why this history of fascism is so gravely misunderstood. Liberal historiography continues to mischaracterize the nature and class character of fascism. Often, we are treated to condescending lectures about the white working class and other such caricatures adored by the punditry. As we mentioned earlier in the video, the middling men provide the social basis for the roots of fascist movements. They may be joined by members or sections of the working class, but it is specifically the psychology of a privileged layer of the social body who feel threatened by the shifting power dynamics, which are peculiar to fascist consciousness. For them, there really was a good old days of sorts to look back on with nostalgia, even if it was built on sand. MJR posits that a political culture shaped by monopoly finance capital, quote, explains why the disguises of American fascism made up the greatest of masquerades. End quote. It is with these issues in mind that MJR again revisits his reasoning for his particular methodology in this work. Using primary sources from Marxist and Marxist adjacent writers from the period, as well as a sharp Marxian economic lens of his own. Quote, as Marx proved and Corey affirmed, the general law of capitalist accumulation only widened the fundamental divide between capital and labor during the 1920s and 1930s. All progress under capitalism was a paradox. The widening gap between wealth and poverty led to a general crisis of American capitalism, and with it, the plausibility of fascism. The liberal perpetuation of a false dichotomy of good versus bad capitalism wrapped in the ideology of American exceptionalism, does much to explain how we got where we are today." End quote. One of the central questions posed by MGR in Part 2 is, was the New Deal fascist? This may sound like an absurd question, but it was a very real one posed by serious critics at the time, so it is necessary to interrogate. A major complication that arises in asking this question is the need to undo and unravel decades of liberal historiography on the nature and impact of the New Deal. MGR notes that liberal historiography has severely watered down an extremely complex set of legislation, all done with the ideological intention to misguide and misunderstand the nature of the New Deal with an ideological gloss. For example, while they were often framed as radical or socialistic reforms, basic safety net measures such as Social Security were done ultimately in the service of big business. Social Security was modeled on the private insurance plans of major corporations, and figures from big business had a significant hand in crafting it. It was, and remains, structured as a regressive tax, which takes money from workers' payrolls rather than the corporate bottom line. While an in-depth dive into the inner machinations of the New Deal is beyond the scope of this review, there are a couple of critical things to note about MGR's analysis of this particular event. With the emergence of the New Deal came the unprecedented extension of the role of the state into the affairs of private enterprise. This could be called state capitalism, or as MJR puts it, state monopoly capitalism. Critical here is the word capitalism. If your definition of socialism is when the government does stuff, you won't like this. State control or regulation of industry is not in any way equivalent to socialism. State control over aspects of the economy is present in all industrial economic systems, whether capitalist or socialist, or at least it has been thus far. As Marxists, we affirm that the class character of a state has significant bearing on what it means for it to be socialist or not. 
in the case of the United States, the capitalist class is still setting the agenda. They are the ones who are ultimately behind the levers of power within the capitalist state. The capitalist state was constructed from its inception to serve and protect its interests as a class. All this is to reinforce the importance of MJR's question, is the New Deal fascist? Let's take a closer look at the fundamental contradictions. FDR's first task to save the American capitalist system started with the banks. MGR argues it is here where the failure to recognize the historical contradiction of labor and capital, or the paradox of capitalist progress, is most glaring. Quote, Liberal reform in response to the abuses of liberal orthodoxy only made liberalism more corporate and subject to the power of the state, end quote. Put another way, FDR's New Deal only temporarily dealt with some class tensions that were brought on by and carried on from before the crash. By ultimately catering to big business, this intensified and gave more momentum to the rise of fascist processes, to the point that fascism has become an eminent and cruel reality. This brings us back to why liberal reformism and historiography continue to pose numerous problems when trying to wrestle with this history and alarming political present. Liberal historiography has worked overtime to skew and mislead the general public's perception of fascism and its emergence in the United States. So much so, as noted in MJR's introduction, that many Americans fail to understand what fascism actually is. And not just right-wingers claiming Antifa are the real fascists, but including people of liberal persuasion. Liberals fail to understand that while Trump may be the most obtuse expression of fascism in America, it's been here well before Trump's time, and it will almost certainly outlive him. It's only now that the American behemoth is rearing its ugly head for all of us to see. The growth of monopoly capitalism is, of course, the principal element in the making of fascism. For accurately speaking, fascism is the political philosophy based on the need of capitalism to employ the power of the state to protect the institution of production for private profit. Maritz Halgren, Seeds of Revolt. MGR's survey of four key works illuminate the discourse of fascism and its possible means of emergence in this period. All of these writers have similar understandings and definitions of fascism, but what's most intriguing about them is where they differ in regards to fascism's full emergence in the United States. The at times convoluted class character and lack of class consciousness among workers in the U.S. makes determining where and how fascism will reach a point of no return all the more complex. Let's explore where these writers diverge on the question of how fascism will show itself in the United States. Carmen Heider argued that American fascism wouldn't require a distinct political party as seen in Germany or Italy, but rather could penetrate into the already existing two-party system without disruption. Like Heider, Lewis Corey saw that the prioritization of big capital and monopolistic firms in the New Deal legislation only furthered distress among America's petty bourgeoisie and this would plummet this class into new forms of reaction. Raymond Graham Swing only viewed the New Deal as fascist in structure, but not fascist ipso facto. He argued that fascism would emerge as a coalition of sorts among various people in power, all to the benefit of big business. Meanwhile, Harry F. Ward contended that, quote, the only thing delaying the drive towards full-blown American fascism was the absence of a popular base similar to the European movements. Fascism, like any other political ideology and form of political economy, isn't always programmatic in either its invention or implementation, and can emerge in multifarious ways. These particular analyses demonstrate the uniqueness of the class composition of the U.S., giving American fascism historically and geographically specific features which differentiate it from its European siblings, but that also unites it with them in its spirit and political character. MGR highlights the false dichotomy of good versus bad capitalism. Looking at the period of FDR's presidency, 
and how this narrative has been told in the preceding decades provides some of MGR's sharpest Marxist analysis. President Franklin D. Roosevelt was, in his own words, the best friend that the profit system ever had. Roosevelt, a liberal committed to saving capitalism, vacillated through his presidency on economic policy, at times adhering to the balanced budget orthodoxy and at other times pursuing public works and welfare programs. He had run for president as a fairly cookie-cutter business democrat, not some radical social reformer. We now generally refer to this as Keynesian economics after English economist John Maynard Keynes, who, unlike his orthodox cohorts, believed that government spending on such programs could boost an ailing economy, even if that meant running a significant budget deficit. Far from any kind of socialist or even social democrat, Keynes, and by extension Roosevelt, believed that capitalism was fundamentally good, but that its worst excesses could be curbed by more intensive regulation and provision of some social welfare by the government. The New Deal, which Roosevelt is remembered for, was as much informed by representatives of big business as it was by socially conscious economic advisors. Although many American titans of industry opposed the New Deal on the grounds that it was inimical to so-called free enterprise, everything from the establishment of Social Security to the National Industrial Recovery Act was colored by the needs of big business, not some purely altruistic social democratic agenda for the U.S. For Roosevelt, there was the bad capitalism of, of monopolies and Wall Street greed, and the good capitalism of small enterprises, family businesses, and the like. As an aside, we will point out that, as Marxists, we reject this dichotomy. According to Marxian economic theory, monopolies inexorably rise from the competition of the business cycle. The big fish eat the little fish. Businesses buy out their competitors, also called horizontal integration, and buy out their suppliers and distributors, also called vertical integration. This process inevitably creates monopolies, and it is fully consonant with the fundamental laws of capitalism. Any attempts to simply legislate this economic law of motion away are fated to have, at best, limited results because of this powerful tendency. This has played out historically in many different contexts. It is not simply a theoretical argument with no empirical basis, but that's a topic for another video. Economist and historian Robert A. Brady pointed to the business system itself, arguing it was a totalizing system of power and thus inherently fascist. Brady argues that the formula for fascism in Germany was similar to the way organized business systems in the U.S. functioned. Ultimately, as affirmed by MGR and his multiple recovered sources, fascism is a function of the monopoly capital enterprise. Brady writes, quote, Every business practices towards its own staff the leader and the authority principles, and it undeviatingly aspires towards the total principle. That is to say, all officers and staff members are appointed and removed from on top entirely at the discretion of management, leader principle, and authority is from the top down, responsibility from the bottom up, authority principle. And every employer attempts to control so far as humanly possible the attitudes, beliefs, and points of view, Welt and Shang, of his employees and every section of the public with which he comes into contact. Total principle. Every business establishment is, in other words, completely autocratic and completely undemocratic in structure, ideology, and procedure. It is, by the same token, completely intolerant of all opposition within or without, or of any criticism which does not redound to the advantage of the profit-making possibilities of the enterprise. The enterprise may be compelled, it is true, to make important concessions on all points, but it should not be forgotten that these are concessions, not departures from principle." End quote. 
In the last chapter of his work, The Spirit and Structure of German Fascism, Brady examines the global character of fascism, rooted in what he calls the unidirectional movement of monopoly finance capital. Like other sources provided by MGR, Brady notes and analyzes the contradictions that gave rise to the Great Depression and the failure to see the irreconcilable nature of said contradictions with the failed recovery plans of the New Deal. Furthermore, Brady notes how the reformist nature of the New Deal not only failed to reconcile the contradictions between labor and capital, but actually furthered the intensity in which monopoly capital centralized itself. Brady's argument that the business system is inherently fascist can be demonstrated by the past 40 years of the so-called employer's offensive and the expanding power of the state and capital. The dramatically increased regimentation of life to the needs of monopoly capital has created a fascistic situation, and its ideological mystification under the guise of so-called neoliberalism has primed a citizenry to misunderstand the coming of the American behemoth. This is what makes MGR's arguments all the more prescient and urgent. American Behemoth is a remarkable work which weaves together a classical Marxian political economic analysis of the interwar years with the writings of contemporaneous personalities ranging from political commentators to economists and journalists. Taken together, they form a compelling narrative about the nature of fascism's American incarnation. The case that MJR makes for American fascism being an organic outgrowth of the logic of monopoly finance capitalism is powerful, as it obviates the usual attempts to measure it against European fascism in a one-to-one -one fashion. Common features of fascist ideology remain. Racism, nationalism, a disdain for democratic institutions, and so on. Fascist gangs like the KKK and the Silver Shirts were no less deadly and dangerous, but they did not possess the same kind of mass character as Hitler's brown shirts or the Squadristi of fascist Italy. Thus, MGR argues, American fascism had its roots in the structural features of big business and the state, which in this period greatly consolidated and centralized their power and influence over society, providing both cause and justification for the increasing class stratification between workers and capitalists and between the racialized groups and whites. The rapacious appetite of American business to endlessly expand the reach of its market to the ends of the earth was one and the same with this increasing fascism at home. This is the titular American behemoth, which MJR warns us has reached its full fruition today. MJR explicitly delimits the scope of his work at the outset. American Behemoth is a survey of this period which focuses on political economy and the work of historical writers, and it does not pretend to be more than that. We offer our criticisms here in good faith as critical challenges to MJR's framework without discounting what we believe is a highly valuable contribution to contemporary discourse on the question of fascism. MJR's framework relies heavily on an analysis of monopoly finance capital, which, while it does hold up well on its own, strikes us as incomplete without the incorporation of insights from anti-colonial theory, such as Fanon, Sakai, Césaire, as well as insights from the Black Radical Scholarship at large. For example, we would be eager to see a conversation between MJR and fellow Marxist scholar Gerald Horn, author of, among many other fantastic books, The Apocalypse of Settler Colonialism. American fascism is certainly, as MJR asserts, an organic outgrowth of the depredations of monopoly finance capital. However, monopoly finance capital is itself built on the foundation of settler colonialism and white supremacy. This fact in and of itself is not lost on MJR, as he pays occasional mention to colonialism and imperialism throughout the text and does not fail to recognize the deeply racialized nature of the phenomenon. We certainly do not mean to imply that he ignores or obfuscates these issues, rather that without such a framework undergirding his overall thesis, it is a very fine house with a foundation which is, for us anyhow, lacking. We would posit our challenge thusly. What marks the borderline between the depravities of settler colonial capitalism and an American fascism? Perhaps, we argue, 
that the transition to fascism from the already ghastly settler colonial capitalist society represents a significant escalation in the scale and intensity of those existing institutions which strangle black, brown, and indigenous people and the working class of not only America itself, but indeed the entire world. We have chosen to call this settler fascism. We agree with MGR that the American behemoth has indeed arrived in its fully actualized fascist form today, but we stress in our framework a longer trajectory, which certainly includes his exposition of the interwar years, stretching back to the genocidal project of the United States as a political entity from its inception. As the calls for land back and Black Lives Matter movements have shown, the central contradiction of the American settler colonial project can be found not only in the despoilations of monopoly finance capitalism, but in the genocide and slavery which are a living wound for this nation, which finds itself in the throes of an extreme, if not existential, crisis. Thank you everyone for watching all the way through to the end. Make sure to click the like button, comment your thoughts on what was discussed in the video, and subscribe to my channel. Make sure to hit the bell so you get notified when I come out with new videos and streams. If you liked the video and you want to help me keep making more in the future, consider supporting the channel financially by going over to patreon.com slash a world to win, where you can help out for as little as a dollar a month. Make sure to also go subscribe to Brianna's channel, Brianna's Library. We put a lot, and I mean a lot, of time and effort into making this video, and we actually wrote a much longer summary and review in text form, which we condensed into the script for this video. If you want to get a much more in-depth look at this book, and written essays are more your style, it will be uploaded later over on my Patreon page as well, and it will be freely available there for all to see. See you all next time. We have a world to win.